Haitian Revolution This article is about the 1791-1804 revolution. For the 1986 revolution, see Haitian Revolution of 1986. Haitian Revolution Part of the French Revolutionary Wars and the Atlantic Revolutions Battle at San Domingo, a painting by January Sohodolsky depicting a struggle between Polish troops and French service and the Haitian rebels. Date Location Location Saint Domingue Result Haitian victory. Territorial changes. Expulsion of the French colonial government. Establishment of the independent Republic of Haiti. Belligerence. Haiti Kingdom of Great Britain Spain, 1793 to 1795, French royalists. French First Republic Polish legions. Commanders and leaders. Toussaint Louverture Jean-Jacques de Salines. Napoleon Bonaparte Charles Leclerc Vicomte de Rochambeau Strength Regular Army, 55,000, Volunteers, less than 100,000 Regular Army, 60, 000, Citation Needed, 86 Warships and Frigates Casualties and Losses Military Deaths, Unknown Civilian Deaths, 100, 000, Citation Needed Military deaths, 37,000 combat deaths, 20,000 yellow fever deaths, civilian deaths, 25, 000. Show less. Battle at Snake Gully in 1802. Battle of Vertiers in 1803. The Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, was a slave revolt in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, which culminated in the elimination of slavery there and the founding of the Republic of Haiti. The Haitian Revolution was the only slave revolt which led to the founding of a state. Furthermore, it is generally considered the most successful slave rebellion ever to have occurred and is a defining moment in the histories of both Europe and the Americas. The rebellion began with a revolt of black African slaves in August 1791. It ended in November 1803 with the French defeat at the Battle of Vertiers. Haiti became an independent country on January 1, 1804. Although an independent government was created in Haiti, the country's society continued to be deeply affected by the patterns established under French colonial rule. Because many planters had provided for their mixed-race children by African women by giving them education and, for men, training an entree into the French military, the mulatto descendants who along with the wealthy freedmen had been orchestrators of the revolution, became the elite of Haitian society after the war's end. Many of them had used their social capital to acquire wealth, and some already owned land. Some had identified more with the French colonists than the slaves. Their domination of politics and economics after the revolution created another two-caste society, as most Haitians were rural subsistence farmers, one, in addition, the nascent state's future was compromised in 1825, when it was forced to pay 150 million gold francs in reparations to French slaveholders, in order to receive French recognition and end the nation's political and economic isolation, two, Though the amount of the reparations was reduced in 1838, Haiti was unable to finish paying off. It's dead until 1947, and the payments left the country's government deeply impoverished. 3. Background Some of the riches of the Caribbean depended on Europeans' taste for sugar, which plantation owners traded for provisions from North America and manufactured goods from European countries. The island also had extensive coffee, cocoa, indigo, and cotton plantations, but these were smaller and less profitable than the wealthy sugar plantations, for, starting in the 1730s, French engineers constructed complex irrigation systems to increase sugarcane production. By the 1740s Saint-Domingue, together with Jamaica, had become the main supplier of the world's sugar. Sugar production depended on extensive manual labor provided by enslaved Africans in the harsh Saint-Domingue colonial plantation economy. The white planters who derived their wealth from the sale of sugar knew they were outnumbered by slaves by a factor of more than 10, they lived in fear of slave rebellion. 5. 
White masters extensively used the threat of physical violence to maintain control and limit this possibility for slave rebellion. When slaves left the plantations or disobeyed their masters, they were subject to whipping or to more extreme torture such as castration or burning, the punishment being both a personal lesson and a warning for other slaves. Louis XIV, the French king, passed the Code Noir in 1685 in an attempt to regulate such violence and the treatment of slaves in general in the colony, but masters openly and consistently broke the code and local legislations reversed parts of it throughout the 18th century. Six. In 1758, the white landowners began passing legislation restricting the rights of other groups of people until a rigid caste system was defined. Most historians have classified the people of the era into three groups. One was the white colonists, or blacks. A second was the free blacks, usually mixed race, known as mulattoes or gens de couleur libres, free people of color. These gens de couleur tended to be educated and literate and they often served in the army or as administrators on plantations. Many were children of white planters and enslaved mothers. The males often received education or artisan training, sometimes received property from their fathers and freedom. The third group, outnumbering the others by a ratio of 10 to 1, was made up of mostly African-born slaves. A high rate of mortality among them meant that planters continually had to import new slaves. This kept their culture more African and separate from other people on the island. Many plantations had large concentrations of slaves from a particular region of Africa, and it was therefore somewhat easier for these groups to maintain elements of their culture, religion, and language. This also separated new slaves from Africa from Creoles, slaves born in the colony, who already had kin networks and often had more prestigious roles on plantations and more opportunities for emancipation. 6. Most slaves spoke a patois of French in West African languages known as Creole, which was also used by native mulattoes and whites for communication with the workers. 7. White colonists and black slaves frequently had violent conflicts, citation needed, Many of these conflicts surrounded the slaves who had escaped the plantations. Many of these runaway slaves, called maroons, lived on the margins of large plantations and lived off what they could steal from their previous masters. Others fled to towns to blend in with urban slaves and the freed slaves who often concentrated in those areas. If caught, these runaway slaves would be severely and violently punished. However, some masters tolerated petty maronages, or short-term absences from plantations. Six. Often, however, larger groups of runaway slaves lived in the woods away from control. They often conducted violent raids on the island's sugar and coffee plantations. Although the numbers in these bands grew large, sometimes into the thousands, they generally lacked the leadership and strategy to accomplish large-scale objectives. The first effective maroon leader to emerge was the charismatic Francois McCandle, who succeeded in unifying the black resistance. A Vota priest, McCandle inspired his people by drawing on African traditions and religions. He united the Maroon bands and also established a network of secret organizations among plantation slaves, leading a rebellion from 1751 through 1757. Although McCandle was captured by the French and burned at the stake in 1758, large armed Maroon bands persisted in raids and harassment after his death. 5. 8. Situation in 1789 Social stratification in 1789 Saint-Domingue produced 60% of the world's coffee and 40% of the world's sugar imported by France and Britain. The colony was the most profitable possession of the French Empire. Saint-Domingue was also the wealthiest and most prosperous, for the plantation owners at least, of all of the colonies of any country in the Caribbean. In 1789, whites numbered 32,000, mulattoes and free blacks, 28,000, and black slaves, an estimated 452,0009, the lowest class of society was enslaved blacks, who outnumbered whites and free people of color by 10 to 1. 5. The slave population on the island totaled almost half of the 1 million slaves in the Caribbean by 1789. 10. Two thirds were African born, they tended to be less submissive than those born in the Americas. 11. The death rate in the Caribbean exceeded the birth rate so imports of enslaved Africans were necessary in order to maintain the numbers required to work the plantations. The slave population declined at an annual rate of 2 to 5 percent, due to overwork, inadequate food, shelter, clothing and medical care, and an imbalance between the sexes, with more men than women. 12. Some slaves were of a Creole elite class of urban slaves and domestics, who worked as cooks, personal servants and artisans around the plantation house. 
This relatively privileged class was chiefly born in the Americas, while the underclass born in Africa labored hard, more often than not, under abusive and brutal conditions. Among Saint Domingue's 40,000 white colonials in 1789, European born Frenchmen monopolized administrative posts. The sugar planters, the Grands Blancs, were chiefly minor aristocrats. Most returned to France as soon as possible, hoping to avoid the dreaded yellow fever, which regularly swept the colony. 13. The lower class whites, petit blancs, included artisans, shopkeepers, slave dealers, overseers, and day laborers. Saint Domingue's free people of color, the gens de couleur, numbered more than 28,000 by 1789. Around that time, colonial legislations, concerned with this growing and strengthening population, passed discriminatory laws that visibly differentiated these freedmen by dictating their clothing and where they could live. These laws also barred them from occupying many public offices, for many of these freedmen were also artisans and overseers, or domestic servants in the big houses. 14. Le Cap Francais, a northern port, had a large population of freed slaves, and these men would later become important leaders in the 1791 slave rebellion and later revolution. 15. Regional conflicts. In addition to class and racial tension between whites, free people of color, and enslaved blacks, the country was polarized by regional rivalries between the North, South, and West. Citation needed. The North was the center of shipping and trading, and therefore had the largest French elite population. The Plain du Nord on the northern shore of Saint Domingue was the most fertile area with the largest sugar plantations. It was the area of most economic importance, especially as most of the colony's trade went through these ports. The largest and busiest port was Le Cap Francais, present-day Le Cap Haitian, the capital of French Saint Domingue until 1751, when Port-au-Prince was made the capital. 15. In this northern region, enslaved Africans lived in large groups of workers in relative isolation, separated from the rest of the colony by the high mountain range known as the Massif. These slaves would join with urban slaves from Le Cap to lead the 1791 rebellion, which began in this region. This area was the seat of power of the Grands Blancs, the rich white colonists, who wanted greater autonomy for the colony, especially economically. 16. The western province, however, grew significantly after the capital was relocated to Port-au-Prince in 1751, and the region became increasingly wealthy in the second half of the 18th century when irrigation projects allowed significant sugar plantation growth. Citation needed. The southern province lagged in population and wealth because it was geographically separated from the rest of the colony. However, this isolation allowed freed slaves to find profit in trade with British Jamaica, and they gained power and wealth here. 15. In addition to such regional tension, there were conflicts between proponents of independence, those loyal to France, allies of Spain, and allies of Great Britain, who coveted control of the valuable colony. Impact of French Revolution Further information, French Revolution In France, the majority of the Estates General, an advisory body to the king, constituted itself as the National Assembly, made radical changes in French laws, and on August 26, 1789, published the Declaration of the Rights of Man, declaring all men free and equal. The French Revolution shaped the course of the conflict in Saint-Domingue, and was at first widely welcomed in the island. At first, wealthy whites saw it as an opportunity to gain independence from France, which would allow elite plantation owners to take control of the island and create trade regulations that would further their own wealth and power, for, so many were the twists and turns in the leadership in France, and so complex were events in Saint-Domingue that various classes and parties changed their alignments many times, citation needed. However, the Haitian Revolution quickly became a test of the ideology of the French Revolution, as it radicalized the slavery question and forced French leaders to recognize the full meaning of their revolution. 17. The African population on the island began to hear of the agitation for independence by the rich European planters, the Grands Blancs, who had resented France's limitations on the island's foreign trade. The Africans mostly allied with the Royalists and the British, as they understood that if Saint-Domingue's independence were to be led by white slave masters, it would probably mean even harsher treatment and increased injustice for the African population. The plantation owners would be free to operate slavery as they pleased without minimal accountability to their French peers. 16. Saint Domingue's free people of color, most notably Julian Raymond, had been actively appealing to France for full civil equality with whites since the 1780s. Raymond used the French Revolution to make this the major colonial issue before the National Assembly of France. In October 1790, Vincent Ogay, another wealthy free man of color from the colony, 
Return home from Paris, where he had been working with Raymond, citation needed, convinced that a law passed by the French Constituent Assembly gave full civil rights to wealthy men of color, Ogay demanded the right to vote. When the colonial governor refused, Ogay led a brief insurgency in the area around Cap Francais. He was captured in early 1791 and brutally executed by being broken on the wheel before being beheaded. 8. Ogay was not fighting against slavery, but his treatment was cited by later slave rebels as one of the factors in their decision to rise up in August 1791 and resist treaties with the colonists. The conflict up to this point was between factions of whites and between whites and free coloreds. Enslaved blacks watched from the sidelines. 5. Leading 18th-century French writer Count Mirabeau had once said the Saint-Domingue whites slept at the foot of Vesuvius, 19, an indication of the grave threat they faced should the majority of slaves launch a sustained major uprising. 1791 Slave Rebellion Enlightened writer Guillaume Raynal attacked slavery in the 1780 edition of his History of European Colonization. He also predicted a general slave revolt in the colonies, saying that there were signs of the impending storm. 20. One such sign was the action of the French revolutionary government to grant citizenship to wealthy free people of color in May 1791. Because white plantation owners refused to comply with this decision, within two months isolated fighting broke out between the former slaves and the whites. This added to the tense climate between slaves and Grands Blancs. 21. Reynolds' prediction came true on the night of August 21, 1791, when the slaves of Saint Domingue rose in revolt and plunged the colony into civil war. The signal to begin the revolt was given by Duty Bookman, a high priest of Vodou and leader of the Maroon Slaves, during a religious ceremony at Bois Cayman on the night of 14 August, 22. Within the next 10 days, slaves had taken control of the entire northern province in an unprecedented slave revolt. Whites kept control of only a few isolated, fortified camps. The slaves sought revenge on their masters through pillage, rape, torture, mutilation, and death. 23. Because the plantation owners had long feared such a revolt, they were well armed and prepared to defend themselves. Nonetheless, within weeks, the number of slaves who joined the revolt reached some 100,000. Within the next two months, as the violence escalated, the slaves killed 4,000 whites and burned or destroyed 180 sugar plantations and hundreds of coffee and indigo plantations. 23. A Slave Rebellion of 1791 by 1792, slaves controlled a third of the island. The success of the slave rebellion caused the newly elected legislative assembly in France to realize it was facing an ominous situation. To protect France's economic interests, the assembly granted civil and political rights to free men of color in the colonies, citation needed. In March 1792, 23, countries throughout Europe as well as the United States were shocked by the decision, but the assembly was determined to stop the revolt. Apart from granting rights to the free people of color, the assembly dispatched 6,000 French soldiers to the island, 24. Meanwhile, in 1793, France declared war on Great Britain. The white planters in Saint-Domingue made agreements with Great Britain to declare British sovereignty over the islands. Spain, who controlled the rest of the island of Hispaniola, would also join the conflict and fight with Great Britain against France. The Spanish forces invaded Saint-Domingue and were joined by the slave forces. For most of the conflict, the British and Spanish supplied the rebels with food, ammunition, arms, medicine, naval support, and military advisors. By August 1793, there were only 3,500 French soldiers on the island. To prevent military disaster, the French commissioner Santhanax freed the slaves in his jurisdiction. The decision was confirmed and extended by the National Convention, the first elected assembly of the First Republic, 1792-1804, on 4 February 1794, under the leadership of Maximilien Robespierre. It abolished slavery by law in France and all its colonies and granted civil and political rights to all black men in the colonies. Despite racial tensions in Saint-Domingue, the French revolutionary government at the time welcomed abolition with a show of idealism and optimism. The emancipation of slaves was viewed as an example of liberty for other countries, much as the American Revolution was meant to serve as the first of many liberation movements. Danton, one of the Frenchmen present at the meeting of the National Convention, expressed this sentiment. Representatives of the French people, until now our decrees of liberty have been selfish and only for ourselves. But today we proclaim it to the universe and generations to come will glory in this decree, 
We are proclaiming universal liberty, we are working for future generations, let us launch liberty into the colonies, the English are dead today. 25. In nationalistic terms, the abolition of slavery also served as a moral triumph of France over England as seen in the latter half of the above quote. Yet the abolition of slavery did not allow for independence, and did not prevent Toussaint Louverture from joining the Spanish army working towards the greater goal of a sovereign Haitian state. It has recently been estimated that the slave rebellion resulted in the death of 350,000 Haitians and 50,000 European troops, 26, according to the Encyclopedia of African American Politics, between 1791 and independence in 1804 nearly 200,000 blacks died, as did thousands of mulattoes and as many as 100,000 French and British soldiers. 27. The author Thomas Carlyle described these events dramatically. Describes disorders and shortages in France, not so much as sugar can be had, for good reasons. With factions, suspicions, want of bread and sugar, it is verily what they call desher, torn asunder this poor country, France and all that is French. 4. Overseas 2 come bad news. In Black Saint Domingo, before that variegated glitter in the Champs Elysees was lit for an accepted constitution, there had risen, and was burning contemporary with it, quite another variegated glitter and nocturnal fulgor, had we known it, of molasses and ardent spirits, of sugar boileries, plantations, furniture, cattle and men, sky high, the plain of Cap Francais one huge whirl of smoke and flame. What a change here in these two years, since that first box of tricolor cockades got through the custom house, and atrabiliar creoles too rejoiced that there was a leveling of Bastilles. Leveling is comfortable, as we often say, leveling, yet only down to oneself. Your pale white creoles have their grievances, and your yellow. Quarteroons? And your dark yellow mulattoes? And your slaves soot black? Quarteronoge, friend of our Parisian brisset and friends of the blacks, felt, for his share too, that insurrection was the most sacred of duties. So the tricolor cockades had fluttered and swashed only some three months on the Creole hat, when Oge as signal conflagrations went aloft, with the voice of rage and terror. Repressed, doomed to die, he took black powder or seed grains in the hollow of his hand, this Oge, sprinkled a film of white ones on the top and said to his judges, behold they are white, then shook his hand and said where are the whites, oh sont less blanks. Before the fire was an insurrection by the oppressed mixed race minority. So now in the autumn of 1791, looking from the sky windows of Cap Francais, thick clouds of smoke girdle our horizon, smoke in the day, in the night fire, preceded by fugitive shrieking white women, by terror and rumor. 28. Leadership of Louverture. General Toussaint Louverture. One of the most successful black commanders was Toussaint Louverture, a self-educated former domestic slave. Like Jean-Francois and Biasso, he initially fought for the Spanish crown in this period. After the British had invaded Saint-Domingue, Louverture decided to fight for the French if they would agree to free all the slaves. Santhanax had proclaimed an end to slavery on August 29, 1793. Louverture worked with a French general, Etienne Lavos, to ensure that all slaves would be freed. He brought his forces over to the French side in May 1794 and began to fight for the French Republic. Many enslaved Africans were attracted to Toussaint's forces. He insisted on discipline and forbade wholesale slaughter. Under the military leadership of Toussaint, the forces made up mostly of former slaves succeeded in winning concessions from the British and expelling the Spanish forces. In the end, Toussaint essentially restored control of Saint-Domingue to France. Louverture was very intelligent, organized and articulate, citation needed, having made himself master of the island however Toussaint did not wish to surrender too much power to France. He began to rule the country as an effectively autonomous entity. Louverture overcame a succession of local rivals, including the commissioner Santhanax, a French white man who gained support from many Haitians, angering Louverture, André Rigaud, a free man of color who fought to keep control of the South, and Comte de Hedeville. Hedeville forced a fatal wedge between Rigaud and Louverture before he escaped to France. 29. Toussaint defeated a British expeditionary force in 1798. In addition, he led an invasion of neighboring Santo Domingo. December 1800. And freed the slaves there on January 3, 1801. In 1801, Louverture issued a constitution for Saint-Domingue which provided for autonomy and decreed that he would be governor for life, calling for black autonomy and a sovereign black state. 
In response, Napoleon Bonaparte dispatched a large expeditionary force of French soldiers and warships to the island, led by Bonaparte's brother-in-law Charles Leclerc, to restore French rule. They were under secret instructions to restore slavery, at least in the formerly Spanish-held part of the island. 30. The numerous French soldiers were accompanied by mulatto troops led by Alexander Pechin and André Rigaud, mulatto leaders who had been defeated by Toussaint three years earlier. During the struggles, some of Toussaint's closest allies, including Jean-Jacques de Saline, defected to Leclerc. Louverture was promised his freedom if he agreed to integrate his remaining troops into the French army. Louverture agreed to this in May 1802. He was later deceived, seized by the French and shipped to France. He died months later in prison at Fort de Joux in the Jura region. 8. Resistance to Slavery File, desalines.jpg Jean-Jacques Desalines For a few months, the island was quiet under Napoleonic rule. But when it became apparent that the French intended to re-establish slavery, because they had nearly done so on Guadeloupe, black cultivators revolted in the summer of 1802. Desalines and Pechin remained allied with France until they switched sides again, in October 1802, and fought against the French. In November Leclerc died of yellow fever, like much of his army, 831. His successor, the Vicomte de Rochambeau, fought an even more brutal campaign. His atrocities helped rally many former French loyalists to the rebel cause. The French were further weakened by a British naval blockade, and by Napoleon's inability to send the requested massive reinforcements after war with England resumed in the spring of 1803. Having sold the Louisiana Territory to the United States in April 1803, Napoleon began to lose interest in his failing ventures in the Western Hemisphere. He was more concerned about France's European enemies, such as Great Britain and Prussia. With that, he withdrew a majority of the French forces in Haiti to counter the possibility of an invasion from Prussia, Britain, and Spain on a weakened France. Dessalines led the rebellion until its completion, when the French forces were finally defeated in 1803-8. The last battle of the Haitian Revolution, the Battle of Vertiers, occurred on November 18, 1803, near Cap Haitian. It was fought between Haitian rebels led by Jean-Jacques Dessalines and the French colonial army under the Viscount of Rochambeau. On January 1, 1804, he won and, from the city of Gonaves, Dessalines officially declared the former colony's independence, renaming it Haiti after the indigenous Arawak name. Although he lasted from 1804 to 1806 several changes began taking place in Haiti. Transnationals became the backbone of Haitian identity as the territory's social structure changed becoming once again an agricultural society in a state of semi-serfdom. A tiny minority of state officials and civil servants were employed, who were exempt from manual labor, included many freed colored Haitians. This major loss was a decisive blow to France and its colonial empire. Free Republic On January 1, 1804, Dessalines, the new leader under the dictatorial 1801 constitution, declared Haiti a free republic in the name of the Haitian people, 32, which was followed by the massacre of the remaining whites, 33, Dessalines secretary Bois Rontonner stated, for our declaration of independence, we should have the skin of a white man for parchment, his skull for an inkwell, his blood for ink, and a bayonet for a pen. 34, Haiti was the first independent nation in Latin America, the first post-colonial independent black-led nation in the world, and the only nation whose independence was gained as part of a successful slave rebellion. The country was crippled by years of war, its agriculture devastated, its formal commerce non-existent, 35, 1, the country therefore had to be rebuilt. In order to realize this goal Dessalines adopted the economic organization of serfdom, 36, he proclaimed that every citizen would belong to one of two categories, laborer or soldier, 36. Furthermore, he proclaimed the mastery of the state over the individual and consequently ordered that all laborers were to be bound to a plantation. 36. In order to avoid the appearance of slavery however, the ultimate symbol of slavery, the whip, was abolished. 36. Likewise, the working day was shortened by a third. 36. Dessalines' chief motivator nonetheless was production and to this aim he granted much freedom to the plantation's overseers. Barred from using the whip, many instead turned to lions, which were thick vines abundant throughout the island, to persuade the laborers to keep working. 36. Dessalines effectively sent the Haitian people back into slavery. Nevertheless, he succeeded in rebuilding much of the countryside and in raising production levels. 36. 
Fearing a return of French forces, Dessalines first expanded and maintained a significant military force. During his reign, nearly 10% of able-bodied men were in active service, 37. Furthermore, Dessalines ordered the construction of massive fortifications throughout the island, like the Citadel La Ferrière. Many commentators believe that this overmilitarization contributed to many of Haiti's future problems, 37 in fact, because young fit men were the most likely to be drafted into the army, the plantations were thus deprived of the workforce needed to function properly, 37. Under the presidency of Jean-Pierre Boyer, Haiti made reparations to French slaveholders in 1825 in the amount of 150 million francs, reduced in 1838 to 60 million francs in exchange for French recognition of its independence. Boyer believed that the constant threat of a French invasion was stymieing the Haitian economy and thus felt the need to settle the matter once and for all. 38. The negotiations for the indemnity were rather one-sided however as French warships were anchored off the coast. 38. The resulting indemnity bankrupted the Haitian treasury. Haiti was therefore forced to take out a loan from French banks, who provided the funds for the large first installment, too, severely affecting Haiti's ability to be prosperous. Haitian forces, led by Boyer, invaded neighboring Dominican Republic in February 1822. This was the beginning of a 22-year occupation by Haitian forces. 39. The end of the Haitian Revolution in 1804 marked the end of colonialism on the island. However, the social conflict that was cultivated under slavery continued to affect the population for years to come. The revolution left in place the Afranchi elite which continued to rule Haiti, while the formidable Haitian army kept them in power. France continued the slavery system in Martinique and Guadeloupe. 16. Impact The Haitian Revolution was influential in slave rebellions in the United States and British colonies. According to Haitian writer Michael J. Dash, the U.S. government feared that a successful slave revolt in Haiti would inspire a similar revolt in the United States. The revolution likely inspired a temporary increase in slave rebellions in the U.S., and this scared southern plantation owners concerned about their own slaves rebelling. After the Haitian Revolution, the U.S. banned slave owners from bringing Haitians over as slaves in order to avoid trouble, although some slave owners ignored this ban. Citation needed. This in turn led to the biggest slave revolt in U.S. history the 1811 German Coast Uprising in Louisiana. This slave revolt was put down and the punishment the slaves received were severe to the point there is no media references to it in existence. 40. This fear resulted in a growing conservatism in U.S. political culture, and leaders began to turn against the ideology of the French Revolution when they saw its influence in the Caribbean. The neighboring revolution brought the slavery question to the forefront of U.S. politics, and the resulting intensification of racial divides and sectional politics ended the idealism of the revolutionary period. 41. Beginning during the slave insurrections of 1791, white refugees from St. Domingue fled to the United States, particularly Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York and Charleston. The immigration intensified after the Journey crisis of June 20, 1793, and soon American families began to raise money and open up their homes in order to aid the exiles in what became the United States' first refugee crisis. 42. While some white refugees blamed the French revolutionary government for sparking the violence in Haiti, many supported the Republican regime and openly expressed their support of the Jacobins. 43. There is also some historical evidence suggesting that displaying Solidarity with the French Revolution was the easiest way for the refugees to earn the support and sympathy of the Americans, who had just recently lived through their own revolution. 44. American slaveholders, in particular, commiserated with the French planters who had been forcibly removed from their plantations in Saint-Domingue. While most of the exiles found themselves in a relatively peaceful situation in the United States safe from the violence raging in both France and Haiti their presence complicated the already precarious diplomatic relations between Great Britain, France and the United States. Many of the white and free people of color who left Saint-Domingue for the United States settled in southern Louisiana, adding many new members to its French-speaking, mixed-raced, and African populations. The exiles causing the greatest amount of alarm were the African slaves who came with their refugee owners. Southern planters grew concerned that the presence of these slaves who had witnessed the revolution in Haiti would incite similar revolts in the United States, and therefore went to significant lengths to prevent the widespread trade of these persons. 45. In 1807 Haiti was divided into two parts, the Republic of Haiti and the Kingdom of Haiti in the north. Land could not be privately owned as it was reverted to the state through Biens Nationaux, national bonds, and no French whites could own any land. The remaining French settlers were forced to leave the island. 
those who refused were slaughtered. The Haitian state owned up to 90% of the land, and the other 10% was leased in five year intervals. Individuals were then divided by economic tasks, where a middle class did not exist. Bound to the plantation by birth, approximately 90% of Haitians were in wage earning serfdom, guaranteeing a permanent self reproducing labor force, also leading to legislation prohibiting marriage between urban individuals and agricultural laborers. Citation needed. Because Napoleon was unable to regain control over Haiti, he gave up hope of rebuilding a French New World Empire. Citation needed. The loss of revenues from Saint Domingue's sugar plantations made maintenance of Louisiana impractical. Similarly, as a result of debts incurred fighting the slave revolt, Napoleon was forced to sell the American government its territories in Louisiana at a heavily discounted price. Citation needed. While such a large scale slave rebellion was never again repeated, the Haitian Revolution stood as a model for achieving emancipation for slaves in the rest of the Atlantic world. In 1807, Britain became the first major power to permanently abolish the slave trade, although the practice of plantation slavery was not fully abolished in the British West Indies until 1833. After the French Revolution, Napoleon reinstated slavery in the remaining French Caribbean colonies, which lasted until 1848. Slavery in the United States officially ended after the passage of the 13th Amendment in late 1865. In 2004, Haiti celebrated the bicentennial of its independence from France. The United States and the Haitian Revolution Main article, United States and the Haitian Revolution The Haitian Revolution provoked mixed reactions in the United States. Southern slaveholders feared that the slave revolution might spread from the island of Hispaniola to the slave plantations of the southern United States. They believed that the African people who they enslaved would be inspired by the Haitian Revolution. This concern was shared by many in the federal government, which sent tax money to help plantation owners trying to suppress the revolution. American merchants conducted a substantial trade with the plantations on Hispaniola, aka the French colony of Saint-Domingue or Haiti. However, there were anti-slavery advocates in northern cities who believed that consistency with the principles of the American Revolution life, liberty and equality for all demanded that the U.S. support the slave insurgents. The Revolution and the Media The revolution of African slaves brought many fears to colonies surrounding Haiti and the Caribbean. Among these fears were that of prominent, wealthy American slave owners, who in reading about the revolution, also read about speculation of what was to come to their own colonies. However, papers like the Columbian Sentinel took the extra steps to support the revolution, in the sense that it was based on the foundations of the American Revolution. 46. The French media also played an important role in the Haitian Revolution, with contributions that made many French upstarts quite interested in the young, passionate Toussaint's writings of freedom. However, all was not simple in the press. A top critic who significantly drove Toussaint into fear of backlash from France was Santhanax, who was responsible for many outlooks of Haiti in the French newspapers. 47, yet, Santhanax was one of the few contenders who truly pushed for the independence of the African slaves and became a major factor in Toussaint's decision of declaring independence from France. In popular culture Cuban writer Alejo Carpentier's second novel, The Kingdom of This World, 1949, translated into English 1957, explores the Haitian Revolution in depth. It is one of the novels that inaugurated the Latin American Renaissance in fiction beginning in the mid-20th century. Madison Smart Bell has written a trilogy called All Souls Rising, 1995, about the life of Toussaint Louverture and the slave uprising. Though not referred to by name, Haiti is the backdrop for the 1990 Broadway musical Once on This Island by Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty. The musical, based on the novel My Love, My Love by Rosa Guy, describes the social stratification of the island and contains one song which briefly outlines the history of the Haitian Revolution. In 2004 an exhibition of paintings entitled Caribbean Passion, Haiti 1804, by artist Kamathi Dancor, was held in London to celebrate the bicentenary of Haiti's revolution. William Dietrich said his 2012 novel, The Emerald Storm During the Haitian Revolution. See also. Maywin. Lamour Disrances. Polish Legions, Napoleonic Period. U.S. Reaction to the Haitian Revolution. An Unbroken Agony, Haiti, From Revolution to the Kidnapping of a President The Crime of Napoleon Bug Jargle Notes
Asterisk please note that the URL and a footnote whose link is followed by an asterisk may occasionally require special attention. 48. Jump up to 1.01.1 in green asterisk Federal Research Service of Library of Congress, 1988-98. Chapter 6, Haiti, Historical Setting, in a Country Study, Haiti. HTTP colon slash slash lcweb 2locgovernor slash frd slash cs slash httoc.html number sign ht0013. Jump up to 2.02.1 a country study, Haiti Boyer, expansion and decline asterisk Library of Congress. 200 a HTTP colon slash slash lcweb 2.loc.gov slash frd slash cs slash httoc.html number sign ht0021. Retrieved August 30, 2007. HTTP colon slash slash www.bloomberg.com slash news slash 2013-05-26 slash Haiti dash s dash x dash slaves dash demand dash land dash and dash mule dash from dash France dash s dash cdc dot html. Jump up to 4.04.14.2 Thomas E. While, Jan Nippers Black, Howard I. Blustein, Catherine T. Johnston, David S. McMorris, Frederick P. Munson, Haiti, A Country Study. Washington, D.C., The American University Foreign Area Handbook Series 1985. Jump up to 5.05.15.25.3 Rigazinski, Jan, 1999. A Brief History of the Caribbean, Revised Edition. New York, Facts on File. Pages 85, 116 to 117. 164 to 165. ISBN 0 8160 2 Site error, invalid ref tag, name brief defined multiple times with different content. Jump up to 6.06.16.2 Laurent Du Bois, Avengers of the New World, The Story of the Haitian Revolution. Cambridge, Massachusetts, The Beltnap Press of Harvard University Press 2004. Haiti French colonialism. HTTP colon slash slash www.crayol.com slash history 003.html. Retrieved November 27, 2006. Jump up to 8.08.18.28.38 for the slave rebellion of 1791. HTTP colon slash slash www.crayol.com slash history 004.html. Retrieved November 27, 2006. Bonham C., Richardson, 1992. The Caribbean and the Wider World, 1492-1992, A Regional Geography. Cambridge University Press. P.166, ISBN 0-521-35977-5. Herbert Klein, Transatlantic Slave Trade, PG 32-33. C.L.R. James, The Black Jacobins, p. 17. Tim Mathewson, A Pro-Slavery Foreign Policy, Haitian-American Relations During the Early Republic, Prieger, Westport, Connecticut. And London, 2003, p. 3. C.L.R. James, Black Jacobins, Vintage, 1989, p. 29. Robert Heinel, Written in Blood, The History of the Haitian People, New York, Lanham, 1996, p. 45. Jump up to 15.015.115.2 Laurent Du Bois, Avengers PF The New World, The Story of the Haitian Revolution. Cambridge, Massachusetts, The Beltnap Press of Harvard University Press 2004. Jump up to 16.016.116.2 Night, Franklin W., 1990. The Caribbean, The Genesis of a Fragmented Nationalism, 3rd Edition. New York, Oxford University Press. Pages 204-208. ISBN 0-19-5054415-5. Site error, invalid ref tag, name Caribbean defined multiple times with different content. Blackburn, Robin. The Force of Example. The Impact of the Haitian Revolution in the Atlantic World. Ed. David P. Jegas. Columbia, South Carolina. University of South Carolina Press 2001. France and the History of Haiti by Giroido Colmain, 
Global Research, January 22, 2010. Hotchild, Adam Berry The Chains, The British Struggle to Abolish Slavery, 2006. Center and Hunt, Liberty, Equality and Fraternity, 119. Blackburn, Haiti's Slavery in the Age of the Democratic Revolution, William and Mary Quarterly 63.4, 633-644, 2006. Censor and Hunt, Liberty, Equality and Fraternity, 123. Duty Bookman, Haitianite.com, 1. Jump up to, 23.023.123.2 Censor and Hunt, Liberty, Equality and Fraternity, p. 124. Blackpass.com, 2, Haitian Revolution 1791-1804. Laurent Dubois and John D. Garrigus, Slave Revolution in the Caribbean, 1789-1804. Boston, Bedford slash St. Martins, 2006. Document 26. Skyna, Robert L., 2003. Latin America's Wars, Volume 1, The Age of the Cotillo, 1791-1899. Washington, D.C., Brassies. Pages 18. Robert C. Smith, 2003. Encyclopedia of African American Politics. Infobase Publishing. P.166, ISBN 1 4381 8 Thomas Carlyle, The French Revolution, A History, Chapter 2.5.4. No Sugar, 3. Review of Haitian Revolution Part 2. HTTP colon slash slash www.webster.edu slash tilde corby tree slash Haiti slash history slash revolution slash revolution 3.htm. Retrieved November 27, 2006. HTTP colon slash slash www.webster.edu slash tilde corby tree slash Haiti slash history slash revolution slash secret.htm. Philippe Girard, The Slaves Who Defeated Napoleon, Toussaint Louverture, and the Haitian War of Independence, University of Alabama Press, 2011. ISBN 0817317325. Haitian Declaration of Independence, Liberty or Death, Indigent Army, by the General-in-Chief de Salines, in the name of the Haitian people. Held in the British National Archives, for Philippe Girard, Jean-Jacques de Salines and the Atlantic System, a reappraisal, William and Mary Quarterly, July 2012. Independent Haiti, Library of Congress Country Studies. Independent Haiti. HTTP colon slash slash www.crayol.com slash history 005.html. Retrieved November 27, 2006. Jump up to 36.036.136.236.336.436.436.536.5 James Laban, The Haitian People, Yale University Press, 1961, 34. Jump up to 37.037.137.2 James Laban, The Haitian People, Yale University Press, 1961, 37. Jump up to 38.038.1 James Laban, The Haitian People, Yale University Press, 1961, 70. Dominican Republic, Haiti and Santo Domingo. Country Studies. Library of Congress, Federal Research Division. HTTP colon slash slash countriestudies.us slash Dominican dash republic slash 4.htm. Rasmussen, Daniel, 2011. American Uprising, The Untold Story of America's Largest Slave Revolt. HarperCollins. Pages 288. Newman, Simon P., American Political Culture and the French and Haitian Revolutions, Nathaniel Cutting and the Jeffersonian Republicans. The Impact of the Haitian Revolution in the Atlantic World. Ed. David P., Jegas. Columbia, South Carolina, University of South Carolina Press 2001. Sonsnowski, Thomas. Revolutionary Emigres and Exiles in the United States. Problems of Economic Survival in a New Republican Society, Unpublished Paper. Popkin, Jeremy D., You Are All Free, The Haitian Revolution and the Abolition of Slavery. Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 2010. Popkin, page 298. Davis, David Bryan. 
Impact of the French and Haitian Revolutions The Impact of the Haitian Revolution in the Atlantic World Ed. David P. Jegas. Columbia, South Carolina, University of South Carolina Press 2001. Mathewson, Tim, 1996 Jefferson and the Non-Recognition of Haiti, P. 30. Jensen, The Santhanax Drama, Toussaint as Political Dramaturge, P. 70. Web pages for FRD country studies are subject to changes of URL. If a page linked from a footnote that cites the Haiti study bears a title different from that cited next to the link, consult a country study, Haiti for the revised URL. Knight, Franklin, February 2000. The Haitian Revolution. Pages 103 to 115. HTTP colon slash slash www.jstore.org slash stable slash 2652438. References Blackburn, Robin. Haiti, Slavery, and the Age of the Democratic Revolution, William and Mary Quarterly 63.4, 633 to 674, 2006. Censor, Jack and Lynn Hunt. Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, Exploring the French Revolution. University Park, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania State University Press, 2001, ISBN 0-271-02088-1. Du Bois, Laurent. Avengers of the New World, The Story of the Haitian Revolution. Cambridge, Massachusetts, Belknap Press of Harvard University, 2005, ISBN 0-674-01826-5. Du Bois, Laurent and Garrigus, John D., Slave Revolution in the Caribbean, 1789-1804, A Brief History with Documents. Bedford-St. Martin's Press, 2006, ISBN 0-312-41501-X. Fick, Carol and the Haitian Revolution and the Limit of Freedom, Defining Citizenship in the Revolutionary Era, Social History, Volume 32. Number 4, November 2007. Garrigus, John D. Before Haiti, Race and Citizenship in St. Domingue. Palgrave Macmillan, 2006, ISBN 1 4039 7140 4. Jegus, David P., Haitian Revolutionary Studies. University of South Carolina Press, 2002, ISBN 1 57003 416 8. Gerard, Philippe. Black Talleyrand, Toussaint Louverture's Secret Diplomacy with England and the United States, William and Mary Quarterly 66 colon 1, January 2009, 87-124. Gerard, Philippe. Napoleon Bonaparte and the Emancipation Issue in Saint-Domingue, 1799-1803, French Historical Studies 32 colon 4, Fall 2009, 587-618. Gerard, Philippe. The Slaves Who Defeated Napoleon, Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian War of Independence, University of Alabama Press, 2011. ISBN 0817317325. Gerard, Philippe. Jean-Jacques de Salines and the Atlantic System, a reappraisal, William and Mary Quarterly, July 2012. James, CLR. The Black Jacobins, Toussaint Louverture and the San Domingo Revolution. Vintage, 2nd edition, 1989, ISBN 0-679-72467-2. Joseph, Solutionel, Race, Religion, and the Haitian Revolution, Essays on Faith, Freedom, and Decolonization, Create Space Independent Publishing Platform, 2012. Joseph, Solutionel. From Toussaint to Price Mars, Rhetoric, Race, and Religion in Haitian Thought, Create Space Independent Publishing Platform, 2013. Ott, Thomaso. The Haitian Revolution, 1789-1804. University of Tennessee Press, 1973. Per Ferry, Joseph Elise. Journal de Operations Militaires de l'Armée Française à Saint-Domingue, 1802, 1803, 2006, ISBN 2-84621-052-7. Popkin, Jeremy D., You Are All Free. The Haitian Revolution and the Abolition of Slavery, New York, Cambridge University Press, 2010. External links